Designing battery-powered electronics is just like doing any other kind of electronic design, right? You still do all the same design. Well, with some concessions to low power, of course. But then there's the battery, and I know we all want to be deep down in the VHDL and Verilog, dealing with complex timing issues, connecting to the Internet of Things, coordinating multiple processor cores, integrating fancy software, and other neato engineering tricks. But then there's the big old battery. We have to charge it. We have to monitor it. We have to keep it from catching fire. <laughs> hey, uh, can somebody just help me out with this battery part? Maybe kind of just do it for me? Oh, hey, just what I wanted. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. And helping me manage my battery issues today will be Richard Del Rossi from Texas Instruments. They've got an awesome set of battery management solutions that will handle everything I need on that whole battery situation. And will help me make a design that will really impress my boss. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that you can click on that Download Now button below your player. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Amelia. I'm glad to be here. So it seems like almost every device I have these days runs on batteries. Why is battery management and authentication important? Well, it's like you said, devices are becoming more and more portable. That's the big trend is towards portability, and where there's portability, there are batteries. Sure. Rechargeable batteries. And where there are rechargeable batteries, you need circuitry to control them. Mm -hmm. So rechargeable batteries need protection, for example, from over-voltage conditions, from overloading conditions. Typically, you'll want to authenticate it mm -hmm. to make sure that it is an authentic battery that goes with your system, and you know exactly how to charge it. Speaking of charging, you need a charger. You can't simply apply a voltage and a current to a battery. It has to be done in a certain way, so you need a digitally controlled charger. Sure. And a lot of systems need fuel gauges so that the system and the end user know exactly how much runtime they have in their battery. That makes sense. So portable electronics come with batteries, and batteries come with battery management electronics. Hmm. At first, battery management electronics were the product of notebook PCs, sure. taking a computer portable. That's something that was very difficult to do. As you might be aware, when you're using a desktop PC, the worst thing that can happen to you is you lose power. Yeah. Right? Power goes out, somebody kicks the plug, and then uh -huh. you've, you've lost everything that you've been doing. I've been there. <laughs> yes. So when you take that computer portable and make it battery-operated, the batteries are going to run out every so often, every three hours, every four hours. You're going to lose power a lot. Yeah. And the system needs to manage that event. So it needs to know, first of all, when is it going to happen? Mm -hmm. And it has to be able to do something about it. Right. So in the case of a notebook PC, it has to learn from its battery electronics, when is my system going to run out of power? And at what point do I have to initiate a shutdown procedure like copying volatile memory to a hard drive or a flash drive or something where the user doesn't lose their work? Right. And that's where the battery management electronics, specifically the fuel gauge, come into play. So, Richard, what kinds of trends are you seeing? So the trends we're seeing are towards portability. More devices are becoming portable than ever before. Yeah. Not just computers and smartphones and mm -hmm. tablets, but also industrial devices. For example, a delivery person might have a device that checks inventory in his truck or his warehouse, mm -hmm. records signatures of somebody they're delivering to. Right. That person is using a lithium-ion battery that needs charging, protection, authentication, and probably gauging because they want to know how much more time can I spend on the road before I have to charge my device. Right, yeah. Medical devices, for example, uh, people don't want to be tied down to hospital beds anymore simply because they have to plug their equipment in. Right, yeah. So we have portable IV delivery systems. Mm -hmm. We have portable monitors for your vital signs. Yeah. We have portable vital sign monitors mm -hmm. now. So patients can move around. They can take their IV delivery system with them. Mm -hmm. They can take their constant vital sign monitoring with them. Mm -hmm. All of these things run on batteries. So the trend is towards portability. The other trend is towards devices getting smarter. Sure. You might see a camera now that runs the Android operating system and can send pictures over Twitter or what mm -hmm. have you. All devices are becoming like computers where you can't just pull the plug from them. Right, yeah. And all devices are becoming portable. Uh -huh. So the trend is towards portable and smart. Hmm. Now you need better battery management electronics. Other trends are now that they're portable and running on batteries, you want the power conversion to be as efficient as possible. 
because batteries only have a limited lifetime, you want to make sure that you're using as much energy of the battery as possible yeah. and converting it efficiently. So that's better charging for efficiency and better fuel gauging for longer runtime. Okay. And more power density, more energy density, more power into smaller batteries. Right. So they're making lithium ion batteries with higher energy density, but also you don't want to waste it because you didn't charge it accurately enough. Right, yeah. Or, or you shut down too early because you didn't gauge it well enough. Uh huh. So again, the importance of charging and fuel gauging ICs. Sure. Okay, Richard, what kinds of products do we need if we're designing an efficient battery powered design? Okay, there are four major functions to battery management. Okay. And that is, number one is protection, because you want to make sure that you don't overcharge your battery and put it into a dangerous state. You don't want to over discharge it or short circuit it or put it in any way where it might become unstable. Yeah. So protection. And number two is authentication, because different chemistries of batteries may have to be charged differently. So the system has to identify the battery, identify its chemistry, maybe even want to identify that it's made by its original manufacturer. Ah, oh, okay. And then there's, of course, charging. Mm -hmm. And that's basically converting five volts you might get from a wall adapter or your PC mm -hmm. into exactly the voltage that the cell needs and also monitor the current that's going into the battery. So gotcha. the charger is a discrete IC and the fuel gauge. The fuel gauge is going to model the chemical reaction that's going on inside the battery and convert that into a prediction of runtime. Okay. So we have gauges and chargers, protection and authentication for single cell and for multi-cell. Single cell might be a handheld device like a cell phone or a mouse or something like that. Mm -hmm. Multi-cell might be a notebook PC that might have three or four cells to get a higher voltage. And then even very high cell count like power tools and automotive, maybe hundreds of cells. Yeah. When it comes to charging, we have linear and switching chargers. The switching charger lets you charge at a higher current. And we have even uh, alternative charging devices like solar and energy harvesting, like drawing energy from vibration or heat mm -hmm. and putting it back into the battery. Okay, Richard, I think I understand charging, protection, and authentication, but what exactly does fuel gauging do for me? Okay, fuel gauging is very familiar to users of notebook PCs. It tells the user exactly how much runtime they have with their device. Ah, if someone's okay. using their PC, they want to know I have this many hours left to show my presentation or work on my document. But as I mentioned that all devices are becoming smarter and starting to run more applications, you're seeing fuel gauging become more prevalent in other devices like smartphones, portable gaming, mm -hmm. uh, GPSs, cameras, things like that. So a fuel gauge can tell the end user exactly how much operational runtime they have in any kind of mode that their system might operate in. Ah. So your phone might be sitting on the table and not doing much, and maybe you have 12 hours of operation in that amount of time. But really what you want to know is, if I were to press talk and have a conversation, how much talk time would I have? Yeah. The fuel gauge can tell you that, even if you're not talking on your phone. For example, it can tell you the talk time, internet surfing time, audio or video time, even if the phone is in standby mode. Okay, yeah. So other than the end user knowing their runtime, are there other benefits that go along with this? Yes, actually the most important benefit of a fuel gauge is that the system will avoid a sudden shutdown. Oh, okay, right. Right, without the end user knowing. Yeah. So to avoid an immediate shutdown, which will cause you to lose work on your PC or your smartphone, mm -hmm. maybe cost you that last picture in your camera, or, yeah. or the last few minutes of your video, if it's a video camera. Sure. Maybe make your health administrator have to not administer a shot or a test and go back to headquarters or get a new battery or get a charger. Mm -hmm. uh, the fuel gauge tells the system when there's just enough energy left in the battery to perform a shutdown procedure to save information or to warn the user that you have one more usage left. Gotcha. Something okay. like this. And once that's established, the more accurate your fuel gauge is, the longer runtime you can get out of your battery. For example, if your fuel gauge has a known error of 20%, yeah. you have to shut down your system 20% early to avoid an unknown uh, or unpredictable blackout. Right. If your fuel gauge is 1% accurate or very accurate, you can get a lot more runtime out of the same battery. Hmm. Okay. So longer runtime and orderly shutdown enables the mobility of very critical devices. Gotcha. Okay. So what kinds of devices are you seeing people wanting to use fuel gauging in? Well, like I said, typically it starts with computing devices like notebook PCs, tablets, and now smartphones. But as devices are getting smarter, we're seeing cameras with operating systems in them mm -hmm. so that you can send pictures out over the internet directly without having to interface to a computer. Right. Or we're seeing people that now that their phones and their tablets can tell them exactly the remaining capacity, they want other devices like mice and accessories like speakers and headphones to also tell them the remaining capacity. 
if you have a phone that tells you I have 12 hours of music left and I want to have a party with my big Bluetooth speaker, right. you also want the speaker to tell you I have 12 hours left. Yeah, true. Yeah. Right. So actually, every kind of portable device now is relying on fuel gauging. Very cool. Okay. So what are the driving needs and requirements that are making people want fuel gauges in these kinds of applications? Why does it make it better? Well, people are doing things on devices that they used to only do on a computer that was plugged into the wall. Yeah. They're shopping now on their phones and on their tablets. And they want to make sure that a transaction goes through without their battery dying and their credit card number being lost in the internet. Right. right. Their GPS, they want to know if they have enough time to finish their trip or their hike or their bike ride. If they're using an office tool on a handheld device, they want to make sure they don't lose their work and they can save it. They have enough battery energy to save it. You know, they want to save the status of a maybe an online game. Mm-hmm. And then syncing between a PC and a handheld device or the cloud. Right. The server might ask the receiver, do you have enough battery energy to accept this download? Mm. And that way it doesn't initiate a download that never finishes. Okay, so if someone is using my battery-powered device and we're getting close to the end of the battery charge, where do we go? What happens? Well, that's the most important function of a fuel gauge is that you don't suffer a sudden blackout. With a reliable fuel gauge, the system knows exactly when it has to do what it has to do to save information. Your tablet can save all of your documents that it has in RAM. Your camera will be able to close its lens cap. Mm -hmm. Things like that. The reliability of a portable device is dependent on its fuel gauge. Ah, okay. Because you never want to just have an unpredictable blackout. Right. As you can see on this slide, won't lose work. That's Uh the most important thing about making computing portable. Absolutely. Right. So do people then develop apps that use fuel gauging? Yes, that's the other thing. So in some computing platforms, you can never predict what somebody is going to do with it. You can never predict what the next application is going to be Sure. that's going to run on your phone or your tablet or your PC. Someone can download anything from the market. A third-party developer can write a tool. and They might write tools that ask the battery, do I have enough runtime to turn on a camera flash mm-hmm. and use it as a flashlight? for example. Right, yeah. That's a new application maybe nobody has thought of, even though the hardware exists. So if your fuel gauge is giving your operating system accurate information about the battery state, a third-party application can then use that. And it can display it to the user as, give me a warning when I have two hours of video time left so I can watch my movie. Right. Something like that. So what if I'm building a device that's simpler than, say, a smartphone or a computer, and I'm not so concerned about losing data? Okay, we also have a general purpose fuel gauges. The difference between a general purpose fuel gauge and a computing fuel gauge is we know the computer has a lot of intelligence built in. Right. We also don't know what's going to end up running on that computer. So the fuel gauge has to be a lot more configurable. The microprocessor of a computing platform can reconfigure the fuel gauge every time it finds a new application running that you know maybe needs to have the gauge woken up at an earlier time or something like that. But mm-hmm. if you have a device like a razor or a mouse or a power bank, which is essentially just a spare battery, it's really going to have one function. It's going to shave. It's going to provide power. It's going to play music out of a speaker. But people still want to know the runtime. In that case, the gauge can be a much simpler device, cost less. In this way, we see fuel gauging proliferating throughout the portable universe and not just on computing platforms. That makes sense. Okay, so Richard, let's dive down to some details here. Tell us how fuel gauging works. Well, fuel gauging is actually a little more complicated than it might seem. The device itself is simple. You just simply ask this integrated circuit, how much remaining capacity do I have? Yeah. How much runtime do I have? And it tells you. But inside, what it's actually doing is modeling the chemical reaction that's going on inside the battery. Cool. It's measuring everything it can measure about the battery, like voltage, current, temperature, and even internal cell resistance. Hmm. And feeding this into a model we call impedance track. Okay. And that model models the chemical reaction going on inside the battery and translates that into a remaining capacity and runtime. Okay. And the benefit you get from that is, of course, the longest runtime because you have the least amount of error that you have to guard bait against Uh before you shut down. You always have secure data and a predictable shutdown point, and you have the gauge being self-learning and adapting as the battery changes over time. Ah, okay. So it stays accurate for the life of the battery. Okay, so I think I understand how fuel gauging works, but that's only a small part of the issue, right? What about charging? Right, so fuel gauging manages the discharge cycle of the battery. It tells you how much runtime you have and when the battery is going to be empty. Yeah. Then you have to charge it back to full again. Sure. And standard chargers, they convert voltage from the wall source or the USB source into a voltage the battery can handle. Mm -hmm. And then they moderate the current into the battery. 
But we find that charging and charge cycles tend to cause the battery a little bit of harm, and batteries degrade over time. Yeah. A brand new battery might give you, you know, many hours of runtime, but after 100 or 200 cycles, it gives you only maybe a few minutes of runtime. Yeah. And end users end up having to replace their batteries. Or in the case of a battery that's embedded, an end user can't replace it. They need an entirely new device. Right, yeah. And devices are getting bigger, and the batteries are getting bigger, and you still want to be able to charge it overnight or charge it in a few hours. So you might ask us, how can I charge this faster? Sure, yeah. And I I would say, well, you can pump as much current in it as you want, but the more current you put in, the more you're going to hurt the battery. So what we have is now the battery management unit where the fuel gauge, since it is modeling the chemical reaction that's going on inside the battery to convert that to a runtime, Uh can also make a model of when the battery is going to experience degradation. Okay. And it can use that model to control the charger directly and charge as fast as possible, but back off to avoid degradation moments. Okay, okay. So tell me a bit more about this battery degradation thing and what goes on here. So we call our charge algorithm the max life battery technology because it is our intention to get the most life out of your battery as possible. Great, okay. While charging it as fast as possible as well. And we want to make an autonomous system. The fuel gauge controlling the charger can lift the burden from you having to write your own charge control software on your system. Gotcha. So typically a charger is an analog component. It mm-hmm. converts current and voltage. But the system will have to do some monitoring of this, and your battery manufacturer might tell you you can't charge when the battery gets this hot. Yeah. So your CPU would have to monitor the temperature, turn off the charger. Right. In our implementation, the gauge will control the charger directly. The gauge is already measuring temperature. It's already measuring voltage and current. Mm-hmm. And it's also modeling the battery's chemical reaction. It can control the charger a lot more intelligently than the system can, mm. and also can relieve the system of that burden. Okay. Richard, how do you charge the battery faster and not run into degradation? Well, we have a model of degradation. So based on the battery's voltage, current, temperature, impedance, state of health, and what's going on in the chemical reaction inside the cell, we can predict exactly when this degradation is going to occur. In fact, we can predict the exact rate of lithium ion and electron recombination that the battery can handle before it goes into a degradation phase which is too much lithium piling up, not enough electrons getting in to recombine with it. Very cool, okay. The result of this algorithm is an output of, here's how much current you can safely charge your battery with. Hmm. Give me 2.753 amps. Yeah. Not just three amps. Right. (laughs) Or not as low as two amps. Mm -hmm. As fast as you can charge it without hurting it. That's the output of our algorithm. And then we use that to directly control the charger. Okay, so how much faster can I charge? The blue curve shows us charging at a standard rate, Uh and then the red curve showing us double the charge current so that we get a much faster charge. In this example, going from almost two hours to almost one hour, okay, saving about 33% of charge time. But you see the red curve causes much more degradation to the battery. Yeah. With TI's max life, we avoid this bump that you see in the red curve on the left by dialing down that current during the degradation phase of the cycle. If you look on the right, you can see we achieve a much faster charge time with the same amount of degradation. If you look at the green curve versus the blue curve, we avoid the degradation that the red curve is giving you, yet still have a fast charge time. Okay, Richard, how do I connect this up to my system? So in the past, the system would connect to the gauge by, say, an I squared C bus, and it would connect to the charger by the same bus. And the system would read information from the gauge about the battery and show the end user the runtime. And the system would also then control the charger and say, give me this much charge current and this much charge voltage, maybe based on this much temperature. Right. Now, we take that connection from the charger away from the system and just put it on the back of the gauge. Oh, okay. And the gauge controls all of the charging. The system merely needs to tell the gauge, okay, you can charge the battery now. Or even leave that up to the gauge and just ask the gauge, are you charging? Right, And the gauge can say yes. Meanwhile, in the background, the gauge is controlling the charger to a very precise point of this much charge current, this much charge voltage, to get the charger to go as fast as it can without degrading the battery. Ah. And all of this transparent and hidden from the system is just happening on its own between the gauge and the charger. So collectively, we call this the battery management unit, charging and gauging all together, all with one interface to the system. Very cool. Okay, Richard, this was quite a bit to think about today. Can you walk us through some of the main points? Yes. So as I mentioned, more and more devices are becoming portable, and they want to get as much power as they can out of a small of size as they can. A small size means more portable, but you want to have as long a runtime as you can. We achieve that with accurate gauging, with faster charging, 
and faster charging that provides better health and longer life of your battery, and a fuel gauge that gives you reliability, no unpredicted system blackouts. Right. So fuel gauge, charger, battery management unit. Fantastic. Sounds good to me. Well, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for joining me today, Richard. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Amelia. Yes. And before we go, don't forget to click that Download Now button below the player to download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talk, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the On Demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>